All right, welcome back. So this month, what the fuck? Where did you come from? All right, so I got a bed now. That's cool. Anyway, um, let's talk about Smashing Pumpkins. I've got a pretty strong relationship with this band, even if it is kind of a weird one. So full disclosure, while I have heard everything after a door, I'm not as familiar with it. I'm familiar with pretty much all their early stuff, but pretty much anything after a door, outside of like the big songs from those records, I don't really know much, much about them. So what better way to fix that than just going through their entire catalog? Another thing to point out right now, um, this band has a lot of stuff, like not just with studio albums, but with, you know, compilations and other stuff. So to narrow this down, I'm limiting it to only the main studio albums and one compilation. And you guys probably know what that compilation is. Alright, so with that all out of the way, let's listen to some Smashing Pumpkins. Okay, you want to talk about good first impressions? You probably can't get any better than Gish. You know, it's an album like this that makes me even more frustrated at Iced Earth. If all these bands could put out a good debut album, why the fuck couldn't they- Nope, sorry, I'm done. I am done talking about this band. Anyway, yeah, um, Gish is great. I love it. It's definitely got a lot more of like a dreamy feel to it. More of a dream pop psychedelic, if that makes sense. But make no mistake, this is still heavy as fuck. And there are some genuine classics on this album. I Am One, Siva, Rhinoceros, Bury Me, Crush, Tristessa, Daydream. Such a good record. Is it one of my favorites? Yeah, it'd make my top five. Would it make my top three? Maybe. It's got some steep competition though. This is an easy recommendation for this band, but I will not make this your first album. Yeah, no, uh, save that for the follow-up. Okay, so before I talk about this album, I need to go over the idea of the sophomore slump. For those who don't know what it is, the sophomore slump is the idea that a band or artist's follow-up album will not do as well as the first. Whether it be commercially, critically, or even both, the second album will be seen as a failure. If you want a good example of this, look at Hootie and the Blowfish. Tractor reviews sold really, really well, and Farewell Their Johnson didn't. The reason I bring this up is because whenever we find an album that doesn't fall subject to the sophomore slump, they're always worth talking about. And you know, there's a lot of good albums to talk about. You no, know, Nevermind by Nirvana, Ride the Lightning by Metallica, Peace Sells by Megadeth. But honestly, I think one fantastic example of this would be Siamese Dream. This is just simply one of the best albums ever made, as far as I'm concerned. This album takes everything that was good about the debut and then just amplifies it. Better songwriting, better production. Like, this is probably one of the best sounding records out of the 90s with all the guitar overdubs. The performances... Okay, let's talk about that real quick. If there's one theme people know about this record, it's the fact that outside of the drums, Billy pretty much recorded everything. Vocals, pretty much every guitar part, the bass tracks. I mean, James and Darcy are still on here. They still lay down, like, you know, the groundwork for it. But from what I gathered, Billy overdubbed the parts himself. On one hand, kind of a dick move. But on the other hand, this is probably one of the most consistent performances on any record, period. And the songs on here, like, there are so many classic Pumpkin songs on here. Cherub Rock, Quiet, Today, Hummer, Rocket, Disarm, Selma, Geek USA, Mayonnaise. I'm just going through every single song right now. I said something similar when I was talking about Nothing's Shocking back in the Jane's Addiction video. This is a near-perfect album as far as I'm concerned. If you're going to listen to The Pumpkins, this is the first one you have to listen to. And the best part is, this isn't even The Pumpkins at their best, I feel like. Because for the next album, they're going to go even bigger and grander. But first, a slight detour. You know, when I originally started this series, I didn't plan on doing compilations. But after giving it some thought, I decided I will for like compilations that really deserve being talked about. And the funny thing is, there were two big ones I could have picked for the pumpkins. 
And I'll talk about the next one briefly when we get to the next section. But if there's one compilation I gotta talk about from the Pumpkins, it has gotta be their B-Sides compilation, Pisces Iscariot. These were the outtakes from Gish and Siamese Stream. The fact that Billy considered these B-Sides is just astonishing to me. There are bands that would kill to have these as like their main album tracks, and Billy said, no, oh, yeah, no, not very good. Put on, put on a little compilation, let's put it out there. For a B-Sides compilation, there are a lot of really good tracks on here. Frail and Bedazzled, Plume, Pissant, Hello Kitty Cat, oh my god, Hello Kitty Cat is so good. Starla, Blue, Spaced. If there's one track that I think most people know that comes from this, it's probably their cover of Landslide by Fleetwood Mac. I'll fully admit, I still prefer the original, but this is one of those few covers that I feel like truly embodies what the original was going for. As much as I love this compilation, I'm not sure if I'd make it a must-listen. If you like what you heard off Gish and Siamese Dream, give this one a shot. It's pretty good. But okay, after this compilation came out, the next year was when we'd get the big one. And I mean that quite literally. Fucking melancholy, oh my god. I mean, what do I say about this album that really hasn't been said before? Like with Siamese Dream, this is just one of the best albums of the 90s. And this is just straight up one of the best albums the Pumpkins would ever make. This band was at such a creative high with this album, it's fucking ridiculous. Pumpkin's albums were already pretty long, I mean, Siamese Dream is like well over an hour. Um, Melancholy is easily double that. Two discs over two hours long, and a total of 28 tracks. That is a sit. And if you guys haven't picked up by now, I don't actually tend to like very long albums. I don't mind them as long as there's stuff actually going on on those records. And with Melancholy, there is not a single moment that is wasted. I mean, sure, there's a little bit more filler on here, but that's what you get for making a double album. But the songs on this album that are fantastic, oh my god. The title track, Tonight Tonight, Jelly Belly, Zero, Here Is No Why, Bowl with Butterfly Wings, An Ode to No One, Cupid de Locke, Bodies, 33, 1979, Through the Eyes of Ruby, Through the Eyes of Ruby, oh my, that's probably one of the best deep cuts this band just has, period. Yeah, one of the best albums this band ever made, easy recommendation. Do not make this the first album you listen to, though. Yeah, I sing this album's praises, but if there's one thing holding this thing back, it has got to be the length. And while I have no issue with it, some people might, and this is a pretty hard album to get into because of it. Definitely listen to this album after it's in the Siamese Dream and Gish. But don't miss out on this album. This is amazing. Now before I go into the next album, I want to talk about a compilation I brought up with Pisces Iscariot. The Aeroplane Flies High. This was a compilation of the five singles they released for the album. Bullet Butterfly Wings, 1979, Zero, Tonight Tonight, and 33. Pretty much what this is, it's the singles, but more. And one of the reasons why I didn't bring it up is, uh, while it is really good, holy shit the fucking length on this thing. I mean, the basic version of it is like an hour and a half long, but then a couple years later, they released a deluxe version which includes even more content. And that version is, like, almost five hours long. Um, it's good. There's a lot of good tracks on there. Proceed with caution. And speaking of proceed with caution, let's talk about the next album. Okay, I know that previous statement seemed really ominous, but you got to consider what was going on behind the scenes at the time. Let's play a little game, shall we? Um, how about we list everything that was going against the Pumpkins at the time, shall we? They had to follow up not just one, not just two, but three highly successful albums. They had to let go of drummer Jimmy Chamberlain. Their touring keyboardist Jonathan Milvoin died while on tour with them. Bailey's mother passed away. Bailey went through a divorce. And of course, the most obvious one, 
all the band tensions finally starting to come to a head. If you're not picking up what I'm putting down, um, this was not a good time for the band. It also didn't really help that Billy was not so subtle in the direction the band was going with this album. This album is more of an electronic album. It features practically none of the giant wall of sound guitars that they are known for. So yeah, as you can imagine, um, a lot of people were kind of anxious about it. In addition to that, as you can imagine, recording this album was also a bitch and a half as well. I mean, fuck, Billy has gone on record to say that Adore was the worst experience he's ever had making an album. When the album came out, reactions were mixed. Critics seemed to generally like it, but a lot of the fans were really divided about it. Like, you either loved Adore or you hated it. And unfortunately, album sales reflected that. This album was considered a disappointment, selling only a million copies. I'm going to repeat that statement. It only sold a million copies. And was a disappointment. Ah, look at this rock band selling only one million copies of the record. God, what a bunch of fucking hacks, am I right? So, enough being around the bush. What do I think of the album? Honestly, no joke, no bullshit. I think this is the last truly great Smashing Pumpkins record. Seriously, Adore is fantastic. I, I love this album so much. It's a different sound for them, but it honestly suits them very well. One of you guys gotta keep in mind is that not only, this isn't just electronica, this is also more of the gothic rock sound, and I love that shit, man. The production on this album sounds great as well, it definitely fits the mood they were trying to set with the songs. And speaking of the songs, they're all great as well. Most people talk about Ava Adore and Perfect, and you know, that's fair, those songs are genuinely fantastic. But there's so many other great songs in this record as well. To Sheila, Daphne Descends, Tear, Apples and Oranges, Pug, Behold the Nightmare, For Martha, Blank Page. Those are such good tracks. Yeah, if you guys haven't given Adore a chance, do so. It's totally worth it. That being said, though, you can definitely hear the struggles going on behind the scenes. Billy Flout stated that this album was made by a band falling apart. And if it's noticeable on this record, it is very noticeable on the next one, I feel like. This record had everything going for it, didn't it? I mean, you had Jimmy coming back, they went back to the hard rock sound that they were known for, and even the singles were pretty decent. Everlasting Gaze, um, Stay Inside Your Love, Try Try Try, those were good tracks. And despite all of that, this is quite possibly the most boring thing I think I've heard the Pumpkins do. I mean, I've heard this album numerous times at this point. Hell, I just listened to this record before filming this segment. But no matter how many times I listen to this record, I just have nothing to say on it. It has zero impact. A lot of people often argue what is worse, a bad album or a boring album. I'd argue the boring album, because at least a bad album, you can talk about it and leave some sort of impact on you. A boring album doesn't. And when you listen to a boring album, at the end of the day, it's just a waste of time. And when an album like Machina is like well over an hour, like an hour and 15 minutes, and you can recall practically nothing about it, that is a big waste of time for me. Like, no joke, this album is like the same length as a door, but this felt like so much longer. And like I mentioned with The Door, this album is the sound of a band just falling apart at the seams. You can tell that they are just done. But we still have one more album before they break up, and this one is kind of weird. So the initial plan was for the band to record a double album, like along the lines of Melancholy. And that's what they did. They recorded two albums back to back meant to be released at the same time. However, due to the failure failure of Adore, the label was really hesitant to put out another double album. So, as the compromise, they put out Machina 1 by itself. Billy wanted to put out Machina 2 as a separate release, but again, the label was hesitant. So, what Billy did instead was he formed his own little label. They printed like 25 vinyl copies, all of which they gave away to friends and to like no radio DJs. 
and gave them instructions on how to rip those vinyls into MP3 and put them online. Essentially, Machina 2 was released for free over the internet. So why do I bring this up? Because that is the most interesting thing about this record. Like, holy Christ, I thought Machina 1 was boring. If Machina 1 puts you to sleep, Machina 2 will put you in a fucking coma. This album just has pretty much nothing on it that I care about. Nor that I really remember, either. I can't tell you anything about the performances, I can't tell you anything about the songs I liked, I can't tell you anything about the songs I didn't like, I can't tell you about the production because the version I listened to was this poor mp3 rip on YouTube. This album is pretty much nothing. On top of that, this album's not even on streaming services. So, practically no physical release, not on streaming services. Yeah, no. Okay, is there anything I can say about this record? It's definitely heavier than Machina 1. Like, there is a bit more edge to it. I don't remember a single thing about this song, but I remember thinking Cash Car Star was fine. So yeah, uh, Machina 2 is not a very good record. And this proved to be like the final straw for the Pumpkins, as a few months later they would play their final show. After the band broke up, the members wanted to do different things. Jimmy and Billy formed a new band called Swan, they put out one record and then broke up a year later. James became part of a multitude of different bands, notably with A Perfect Circle. And Darcy just kind of retired from music. Honestly, we haven't- I don't think she really did anything after the Pumpkins. And so ends the story of the Smashing Pumpkins. Then 2006 happened. Night, every yeah, 2006, the band got back together. Okay, well, Jimmy and Billy got back together, but the Smashing Pumpkins are back. And throughout 2006 and 2007, they recorded a new album. Apparently recording this album was very reminiscent of how they did it in the 90s. No click track, recorded the tape, like, apparently they used the same tape recorder for um, Melancholy. And, like with Siamese Dream, it was really just Billy and Jimmy playing everything. The result was 2007 Zeitgeist. And can I just say that after the Machina albums, this is such a huge breath of relief. Yeah, guys, this, this is a good one. I, I really, really like this record. The first thing I want to praise, right off the bat, Jimmy motherfucking Chamberlain, man. Jimmy easily does the best drum performance I think I've heard him do on a Pumpkins record. And apparently a lot of this was done in one take. Like, if you want more proof that Jimmy is such an underappreciated and underrated drummer, listen to Zeitgeist. Billy does a good job vocally. Like, I like a lot of the vocal harmonies that he did with himself. And the songs, oh my god, the songs on this record are really, really good. Doomsday Clock, Seven Shades of Black, Bleed in the Orchid, This is the Way My Love Is, Tarantula, Stars, Never Lost, Bring the Light. Those are really good tracks. Now, this album isn't perfect. While, while the songs on here are really good, there are some songs I feel like just are just kind of there. I like United States quite a bit, like, I especially love Jimmy's drumming on it, but I feel like that they cut that song in half you still have gotten the point. As good as Jimmy and Billy are on this record, it feels kind of odd to call this a Pumpkins record and not have Darcy or James on it. I think my biggest problem with this record was how they distributed it though. See, what a lot of bands will do is that after they put out a record, a few months to a year later they'll put out a deluxe version which will contain bonus tracks. Billy did this with Zeitgeist. Only issue is, he did it on the day of release, and there's like six different versions of it. Like, Jesus Christ, why would you do this? Six different versions of the same album, all of which featuring like no slightly different album art. It's the same thing, just like different colors. And each one has like no bonus tracks unique to that version. I think the silver cover is like completely resequenced as well. As someone who just recently got into collecting records, this is like the biggest pain in the ass for any record collector out there. Because the biggest curse for a record collector is you've got to have everything. On top of that, this record's not even on streaming services. It's not like a case with Machina 2, like Zeitgeist initially was, but I think due to label issues it was taken off. So this album isn't really that easy to come across. 
I got lucky and found an MP3 download online, but if you go onto YouTube, you're going to get a lot of low quality rips. Grievances aside, Zygeist is great. Definitely listen to it after you listen to some of the early records. Um, it's fine. It's okay. Yeah, this might be a pretty short segment, so I'm just gonna get this out of the way. I liked the production on this record. Billy sounded pretty good, and the rest of the band does fantastic as well. And you know, there are some decent songs on here. Quasar, Panopticon, Celestials, Violet Rays, My Love is Winter. Yeah, those are really good. On the other hand, though, if you felt James and Darcy's absence on Zeitgeist, you'll feel it here as well. And you will feel Jimmy's absence as well. Like I said, the rest of the band does fine, but there's just something missing when it's just Billy, you know? On top of that, this album is also very front-loaded. Like, all the songs I just listed, those are literally like the first five songs on this record. Everything else on here, while not necessarily bad, they leave no impact in any way. Add that to the fact that this album is over an hour, and you got a lot of just... meh on here. So yeah, um, not bad. It's definitely an album that you enjoy in the moment, but once you finish it, you're not going to really remember much or go back to it. The stuff on here that's good is good, but for what it is, it's really just okay. This record, on the other hand, oh my god, this is good. I, I really like Monuments. I mean, any album that opens up with a track like Tiberius is going to be put on a pretty high pedestal, I think. And there are some pretty good songs on here as well. Being Vage, Anias, One and All, Run To Me, Antihero, that, those are really cool tracks. There's a lot more emphasis on synthesizers on this record, and that I feel like it fits them pretty well here. I think the thing I like the most about this, though, is that this album is short. Like, really short. Like, Barely over 30 minutes short. This feels like an EP if it's coming from the pumpkins, honestly. <laughs> that being said, some things from Oceania still carry over. It still feels weird that this Billy calls us pumpkins when it doesn't have the other members on it. Again, everyone does fantastic, but it still kind of has that holdover. Some of the tracks on here I don't think are nearly as memorable. But overall, I'd say Monuments is much better than Oceana. It's, I definitely enjoyed it a lot more. i definitely say give this one a listen. Okay, first off, can we, we can agree that name is bullshit, right? Like, shiny and oh so bright vol- wait, what was it again? Shiny and oh so bright volume 1 LP, no past, no future, no sun. What the fuck is that name? Seriously. Anyway, um... I remember when this album was coming out, and I remember just the hype being through the roof for this thing. Because not only did we get Jimmy back, we got James back as well. Yeah, Darcy's still missing, but you know, given the comments she and Billy have made about each other over the years, I don't really see that happening. On top of that, Working with Rick Rubin, another album that's honestly really short, like this one's like, yeah, this one's also like about 30 minutes. And the result was an album that at the end of the day is just... Whatever. Yeah, this th this should have been better. This really should have been much better than it was. I mean, it's not bad. There are definitely moments on it I do like. Knights of Malta, Solera, Marching On, Seek and You Shall Destroy. Those are pretty good. But outside of that, this album's just kind of boring. And again, for an album that marks the return of James Eha and Jimmy Chamberlain, you would expect something just a little more, you know? So yeah, not bad. Should have been so much better though. So this came out of nowhere. Yeah, um, the band went synth pop on this record. And I remember talking to some people around the time this album came out and they just were not into this. And then there's me who has to be the weird fuck and say that I actually really enjoy this record. But then again, I'm also the weird fuck that loves a door and thought that the synths on Monuments were good. So yeah, it's an interesting direction from the go, but you know, I felt like they actually did a pretty decent job with it. 
I can safely say that this is probably the most interesting thing the band has put out in a very long time. And you know, uh, there are a lot of tracks on here that I really enjoyed. Color of Love, Confessions of a Dopamine Addict, the title track, Dulcet and E, Ramona, Witch, Minerva. Minerva was a good track. I really liked that one. I do have some issues with it though. First off, this did not need to be a double album. It's one of those things like, you no, know, I felt like this woman better if it was like, you no, know, like an EP or like an album of like maybe 10 songs. 20 songs feels like you're really stretching it. And as a result of that, it feels like a lot of the tracks just kind of blurred together. And on top of that, as much as I like this record, I can't see them doing this, something like this again. This feels like a one and done kind of deal. But you know, for a one and done kind of record, I really enjoyed this. I thought this was fun. So, um, two things happened when I was making this video. The first one was that the band announced that they finished recording their next album. And apparently it's supposed to be the sequel to Melancholy and the Machina albums. And I can't help but, you know, select my collar a little bit at that statement. Because not only are you saying this is a sequel to Melancholy, one of the best albums of the 90s, but a sequel to Machina? Are you fucking serious? And the second thing was that they announced that later in 2022 they're going on tour with motherfucking Jane's Addiction. You better believe I got my tickets to see that. The Smashing Pumpkins are kind of a mixed bag, all things considered. Because w when this band was bad, yeah, they were pretty bad. But when this band was at the top of their game, there was no one else like them. If you want to get into the Smashing Pumpkins, yeah, Siamese Dream, duh. After that, go to Gish, then Pisces Iscariot, and then check out Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness. And that was the Smashing Pumpkins. Colin, I hope we can still be friends after this. I don't know when the next one's gonna come out. I'm gonna try to aim for June. I wanna try to get that collection video done before then, but who knows? We'll see what happens. As for the band for next month, um, I'm stuck between two. If I can do the polling on my channel, I'll definitely do that, but if not, I'll leave it down in the comments below, and I'll let you guys vote on it. Thank you for making it to the end of the video, and hope to catch you next time.